Hey, well, again, good morning. I want to invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We have been in the book of Ephesians for a while, so if you're brand new, this has been a, an ongoing series since the fall where we have been walking through this, this great letter that Paul writes to the church. And we have been on the front half of the book of Ephesians, chapters 1 through 3, deals with how we or what we are to believe as Christ's followers. It's where Paul talks about in Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but now Christ has made you alive, and it is theology rich. But then the back half of Ephesians, they fit together because the first half is declaring, here's what you are to believe. Here's who you are in Christ. And then the back half is, here's how we behave like Christ. Here's what we are to believe in Christ, and here's how we are to behave like Christ. Christ. And so the back half of this book is very practical. And so today we are looking at what a Christ-centered marriage looks like. And we're about to dive into that. I know some people in the room, you're married and your ears perked up immediately. You're excited to hear, or maybe you're not that excited to hear about that. I know some in the room aren't married, uh, and that's totally fine because what you're going to see, I don't want you to tune out because what you're going to see as we walk through this passage is you're going to see Jesus. And whether you're married or not, this passage and how Christ is explained and what he is doing for his church, which is you, is so imperative to know and practical to live out. And as we're as we're as you're turning there, I I want to share with you a, a quick moment I had with a with an older guy who had been married for a lot longer than me. I was just a few years into my marriage and he and I were talking just about life and about marriage and he said, son, he was he was mid forties and he said, son, I've I've been married for twenty five years. And I said, wow, man, 25 years. I wasn't even 25 years old at the time when he told me that. And so that just seemed like such a long time. And he said, yep, it's been the best 20 years of my life. And I remember I kind of paused and thought that was, that was an odd statement. And he was obviously cracking a joke. But he went on to share with me some of the greatest wisdom I've ever received in regards to marriage. He went on to tell me, Blake, there were some years in there that were really hard. That they hurt, that it felt like a war more than a, a romance. They were difficult years, difficult seasons, difficult days. Matter of fact, I heard a preacher say one time, he said, marriage is designed by God to kill you. It's a pretty dramatic statement. But he went on to say, marriage is designed by God literally to kill the self-centered parts of you. That you don't realize how self-absorbed a lot of us are until you get married. And then that process reveals to you how, how self-centered you actually are. It's designed to kill you. Marriage is hard. And it's difficult. And a lot of us carry scars and hurts. Maybe there's some unforgiveness in the house. Brought about by marriage. As a matter of fact, we're going to look this morning at this passage of Scripture, and I want to start off by, by, by stating to have, it is impossible to have a Christ-exalting marriage without Christ. And we're going to see the, the secret to having a great marriage. As a matter of fact, it's actually very simple. How we can have a successful Christ-exalting marriage, and the secret is one person. One truth. And we're going to see that this morning as we dive into this passage. I'm going to read this, uh, verse 22 all the way to verse 33, and then we're going to dive into how we can have a successful marriage in the eyes of God. Let's begin at verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with you in reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see that she respects her husband. A lot that is packed into these passages of Scripture this morning. We're going to go pretty quick But I trust that our time will be beneficial for you and your marriage. Let's pray this morning as we dive into three simple truths to have a successful marriage. Father, I I confess and admit, having already preached this sermon once, and I confess and admit it again, that God, without your help, without your strength, without your truth, I am simply a person talking words. And Lord, I can't be the husband that you've called me to be without your help, without your spirit working in my life. And so, Father, I I confess that, and I pray, God, this morning that we collectively confess that, that, God, the hearts in the room that are longing to have a healthy marriage, a a, a successful marriage, a Christ-exalting marriage, that, Lord, this morning you would speak truth and life. Father, I know that there may be husbands or wives this morning who don't know Jesus, who aren't saved. And so, Father, I pray this morning you'd save them and you would draw them to yourself, forgive them for their sins. And, Father, I pray that you would do immeasurably more this morning than we've ever asked or even imagined. And I pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What is the secret to having a godly and successful marriage? Well, Paul has actually already given us the secret there in the last week's sermon. And if we want to hop back for just a moment, Paul compares and contrasts two types of people. The first person is the person who is filled with wine or who is a drunk or an alcoholic. And then he contrasts that with someone who is filled with the Spirit. And so he's literally saying you can choose to fill your body with one thing or the other. But when he goes on to explain what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit, he explains how that looks, the evidence that someone is truly filled with the Spirit. You can look back up in in, uh, chapter 5 in verse 15 through 21 to see that. But he says, hey, if you're filled with the Spirit, they're going to speak with each other in in words and hymns and spiritual songs. You're going to sing and make melody with your heart. You're going to give thanks in all circumstances. And then he goes on to say, and you're going to be subject to each other. When Paul dives into husbands and wives, he is not making a break in that thought. We have a separate paragraph here, but Paul doesn't. And Paul is helping us to understand that the secret to having a godly and successful marriage is not you and I knowing this passage. It's not you and I memorizing this passage. It is by you and I surrendering ourselves to the Spirit of God, being filled with His Spirit, and then living out What Christ desires. And we're going to dive first into what that looks like for a wife. The first truth here is that the Spirit empowers wives to respect their husbands. Now, when I talk about the Spirit, we remember just for a quick theology lesson. You have God the Father who sent God the Son to the world. God the Son died on the cross, He was buried, and He resurrected. And then God the Son sent God the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, the Spirit was always at work, but the Spirit began to live in the church, people who were saved in Acts chapter 2. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit that lives inside of people who have repented and believed in the gospel, who are saved, the Spirit, the Spirit of God is who helps us live this out. But let's dive first into what Paul says to the wives. He says, verse 22, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now we need to understand something. 
I know this is a controversial idea, especially in our culture. Not to what it says to the husbands, but what it says specifically to the wives. But I want to make a few points about that. The first is... What Paul uses, the word there, be subject to your husband, is the same word he uses in verse 21 when he says, and be subject to each other. So Paul is not calling, God is not calling wives to do something that is totally radical from what everyone in the church is supposed to be doing. My job is to be subject to each of you. I am a waiter for you, not some prominent leader who is above you spiritually. My job is to be subject to you, to serve you, to do all that I can to think of you as more importantly than me. Matter of fact, Philippians 2 tells us all of us are to do that, that we are all to consider other people as more important than ourselves. And what Paul is telling the wives here is the same thing he's telling all of us to. Sometimes the wives hear that like, oh, that's such an odd command. That's not right. He's just telling us to do that. No, he just told the entire church to do it. Everyone in the building, everyone in the house, hey, do this for each other. And then wives, as I'm talking to you, hey, do this to your husbands. Now that word, be subject to. It's an interesting word. It's an important word. He says, be subject to your husband as to the Lord. That means to serve. The idea literally is, it's where you get the idea of a support system. That we don't support Jesus, but we are the manifestation of Christ to the world. I mean, to make this really simple, right here. See that beam running all the way across this building right there? That is holding this building up. It is supporting this building. You take this beam out, and we're going to have some structural issues. Matter of fact, you take a couple of them out, and this is all going to come crashing down, okay? We don't want that to happen, so let's hope it's not. But the word here in Greek literally means the wife is to support. The wife is to come under. The wife is to give strength to her husband. And he says, as to the Lord. Ladies, you need to understand that Christ is ultimately not calling you to be a doormat to your husband, but to be a servant to Jesus. Let me say that again. Christ is not calling you to be a doormat to your husband, but a servant to Christ who loves you, who cherishes you, who adores you, who will never mistreat you, never abuse you, never leave you, and never forsake you. As to the Lord. We're going to look at what that means here in just a sec. But he goes on to say, So for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands. Why is this? Have you ever thought about that? I'm sure some of you have, especially if you're ladies and you're married. Why does he say this? Like why would he, why would he tell wives to do this? Well, to understand why this is taking place, we need to go all the way back to the beginning of the story, Genesis chapter 3. Some of you may know this, some of you may have never realized this. And you have hated this passage of Scripture your whole life because you didn't know why he said it in the first place. But in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve have sinned, we know the story, they disobeyed God, they sinned, and then God came down and God curses the serpent, God curses Eve and God curses Adam. And in that curse to Eve, he tells her, you will have pain in childbearing. And a lot of us are familiar with that idea that the pain associated with childbirth is a part of that curse. But also, what we don't read or realize is that in Genesis chapter 3, God says, not man, not Adam, but God says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. That word for is also translated in Hebrew as against. And what God is declaring is because you have done this, because you have reversed the roles that I have put in place for husband and wife, you will constantly be cursed with a desire to rule over your husband. And the idea there is men will typically be stronger, and so you will never be able to physically overcome your husband. Yet he will rule over you. That is a part of the curse. The idea to control or manipulate or to browbeat your husband is from Genesis 3. 
And so what happens is Adam and Eve are there serving together as the right first family. And then when Eve takes control, remember, Satan taught to Eve. Now, guys, don't point the finger at the woman and be like, exactly, this is all your fault. No, because what Scripture tells us is Adam was there, but he was passive. He didn't do anything. He didn't speak up. He didn't lead. He let his wife walk into the temptation of Satan. And what Eve did is she reversed the roles. I'm in control. I make the decisions. I lead this. And Adam was passive. See, a lady in the curse wants control, and men under the curse, we want to be passive, to not lead, to care more about our hobbies than we do about our home. But we'll get to the guys here in a second. So what Paul is calling wives to do, filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit is the only way that we can do this, is to make right what the fall made wrong. Now, now that we understand why he is calling for this this balance to come back, you also need to understand something. He says here, in everything you are to be subject to your husbands. And I don't want to necessarily go against Scripture, which I'm not going against Scripture, but I do want to make clarity here in regards to what Christ is calling. There's two things that you can rest assured. If your husband is asking you to do this, you do not need to do them. You are not under, you are under no biblical obligation to do this. And the first is this. If your husband is asking you to do something that is immoral, that is immoral, something that goes against Scripture, something that is inappropriate, something that is, uh, that is not right and in line with God's calling for holiness in our life. If, if For instance, if you do the books, you, the wife does the taxes, and the husband comes in and says, oh, hey, why don't you just smudge those numbers a little bit, and let's just say we did this instead of this, and let's just do that. That's immoral, and it's the second part, illegal. But that's immoral, and you have no moral obligation, no biblical obligation to do something that your husband's asking you to do that's immoral. But then secondly, you have no biblical obligation to be subject to him if he's asking you to do something that's illegal. Illegal or immoral, there is no biblical obligation for you to fall in line with his leadership. But if he's not asking you to do something or leading your family that's immoral or illegal, you may want to listen to him. Now, this also doesn't mean, because I know that men take advantage of this. There are women who take advantage of this, but there's also men who take advantage of this. This doesn't mean, be subject to does not mean be silent. You just go along with whatever. To just let him rule and do whatever he wants to do and you just stay at home and cook and clean and take care of the kids because he's the leader. No, we're going to look at the men's role in leadership here in just a moment. He's not calling you to be a doormat. He's calling you to ultimately be a servant of Jesus. Let me share something with you how this became real for my family, okay? For me and my family, how it impacted my marriage. So my wife, when I was in seminary, was a part of a, a discipleship group. And she was being led by a lady named Iva. And Iva was uh, married to one of my seminary professors. And she was incredible. She knew the Bible better than any person I ever met. She was a phenomenal Bible teacher. She was an excellent person, fun to be around. And she got her and her group of ladies, it was all ladies that were part of her discipleship group, she began to talk to them about what it looks like to be submissive in marriage. What does that look like? What does that actually mean? Because again, this lady was a pistol. She was tough. But she began to explain what that actually looks like. And she said, ladies, I want you to imagine something. She got three of these ladies up here. And some of you have heard this before. Some of you may not. She said, here's your husband right here, standing right here. She said, and here is God right here. And she had another lady standing right here. So you got the husband, you've got God. And she said, some of you ladies are right here in front of your husband, and you are letting him know how he needs to live, how he needs to be, what he needs to think, what he needs to do. You are being God to him. You are instructing, directing his path. You are, you are owning him. And she said, what submission looks like is not you bowing down to him. Oh, great husband, you lead me and serve me and I'm your doormat. No, that's not what he's calling you to do because he says, as to the Lord. Here is what submission in marriage, being subject or respecting means. It means you taking your finger out of his face and you stop blocking the view that he has to God and you ultimately are subject to Christ. 
that you bow at Jesus' feet every morning and say, as to you, help me to him. And what happens when a wife bows before Christ and serves Christ, and that is an overflow into her marriage, look what happens. He can see Jesus. He doesn't need you to be his Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, you are an awful Holy Spirit. I am an awful Holy Spirit. But when you submit to Christ, he can see Jesus. When you're not in his face, when you're not telling him what he needs to do and how he needs to live. Now, we need your help. No doubt. And we're going to dive into what that looks like here in a second for the gentleman. But that's what it looks like for wives to respect their husbands. <sighs> okay, now I can breathe. Now I'm past that part. Okay. We all good? We ready to move forward? Y'all okay? Okay. Awesome. <laughs> y'all are like, whatever. I'll wake y'all up this morning. So the Spirit empowers wives to respect their husbands. And it is by no other power than by the Spirit of God empowering you to be subject to your husbands. To respect your husbands. But the second truth is this. The Spirit empowers husbands to serve their wives. The Spirit empowers husbands to serve their wives. The Holy Spirit is the secret sauce for men to be the men that God is calling them to be. Let's dive back in. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. I want to pause right there. Paul is telling the husband, your job is to love your wife, and it should mirror, it should reflect, it should look like Jesus is coming to earth to die for his church. Very simply put, he is telling husbands, you are to be a servant leader. Because when we think about Christ... Jesus literally left all of the power, all of the positions, all of the authority, all of the rights, all of the privileges, everything that he had in heaven. He left it on his throne to come down to earth, to be born in the most humble means, and to suffer and die a criminal's death for you and me. And he's telling husbands, your love for your wife should look like that every single day. A sacrificial, a, 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 a selfless love. You know why? Because of Genesis chapter 3, when Adam decided to be passive, when Adam decided not to lead, not to give up himself and to serve his wife, he let his wife walk into that moment and he stood there passively. And so God is now calling men to be proactive, to lead, but to lead in love. Those three words, gentlemen, should, should, lead, should stay in your mind as we leave this place tonight. Lead in love. Love. And he goes on and he says this, explaining Jesus. This is where it, it, it hits everybody in the house. So that he might sanctify her. This is Jesus and the church, not us and our wives. So that he might sanctify her. That word sanctify means set apart to make different having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and blameless. What does that mean? What does that mean for husbands? What he's helping us understand, this is for everybody in the house this morning. What he is helping us as husbands to understand is for all of us to understand that Jesus doesn't give up. That Jesus keeps working on us. Jesus keeps sanctifying us. Literally, Philippians 1, 6 says, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ. What all of you in the house need to realize is that God is not done with you. Jesus is a relentless husband who will not leave you, will not forsake you, even when you and I are like, yeah, I'm done with this thing. The husband will run down the aisle after his bride. He will not quit on you. So some of you came in here this morning. You may not be married. You may not. But let me just make a separate point that has nothing to do with marriage and has everything to do with you and Jesus. He will not stop running after you. You walked in here with guilt. Yeah, we can celebrate that. You walked in here with guilt or fear or shame. And listen, he is going to keep tailing you with his love. His grace is going to not let him stop chasing you because he loves you. 
And he says, hey, husbands, do the same thing with your wives. When she turns her back on you, when she curses your name, you go after her. You love her. You forgive her. I tell guys all the time, you being the servant leader means this. You apologize first. I'm going to say that again. You being the servant leader, right or wrong, means that you go to her first. What does God do in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sin? Does he come down and like, where are they? I'm about to take them out. Does he stay up in heaven and just disregard them? Like, well, too bad. Sorry, they made that decision. No, Scripture tells us the most beautiful words, I believe, in, in the Bible. God came seeking after them. God is always a God who seeks after those who have left him. And the same application is then applied to the husband. Run after her, even when she's running away from you. And he goes on and he, he says, Husbands ought also to love their wives as their own bodies. For Verse 29, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. I want to make a point about that too. For everybody in the house, husband or wife, married or single. Jesus loves and cherishes you. He loves and he cherishes you. With your sin, with your faults, with your failures, with every bit of who we are that is broken and busted and bleeding, Christ declares, I cherish you. I'm not done with you. I'm working in your life. I love you. We just sang it just a while ago. Even when I don't feel it, you're moving. And I, even when I don't see it, you're moving. The enemy wants us to think Jesus is done with us, that he's done with you, that he wants nothing to do with you. But what Paul is declaring here is that Christ cherishes you. And then he says, husbands, cherish your wives in the same way. Celebrate them. You know, I want you to think about this for a moment. In Genesis chapter 3, everything connects to Genesis chapter 3. Matter of fact, everything connects to Genesis 1 through 3. The story of the earth is told in three chapters of the Bible. But I want you to think about this, gentlemen. Before Adam and Eve sinned, matter of fact, before Eve was ever there, and it was just Adam, Scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 2 that, that God had an assignment for Adam. He wanted him to name all of the animals, every single one of them. He had a job. He had work that he had to do. And God did that. So I want you to put yourself in Adam's shoes for a second. Like, think about this for a second. God makes every animal pass by, elephant, donkey, duck, Porcupine, at 9.30 I almost said pineapple. I don't know why, but I literally said pine, porcupine. I don't know why. But anyway, Adam names all these animals. And as Adam names every single animal, that building anticipation keeps welling up in his heart. Yeah, that's not like me. That's not like me. That's not like me. That's not like my kind. That's not like my kind. And Scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 2, go back and read it, look at it. In Genesis chapter 2, God uses work to help Adam realize that he needed a wife. He needed a helper. He needed somebody like him. God saw Adam in his, in his perfect state prior to the fall and realized he wasn't good enough. He needed help. So prior to the fall, here's the point I'm making. Prior to the fall, God used work to help Adam realize he needed a wife. But here's what happens now because of the fall, because of sin that has now come into the world. Men run from their wives to their work. Prior to the fall, God used work to help us realize we needed a wife. We needed a helper. We needed a companion. And what now happens is because of the fall, because of men who aren't filled with the Spirit or who aren't pursuing Jesus, men will take their work and run from their wives with it. This is what I do. I'm providing. I'm, I'm doing this or doing that. And we take what God wanted us to do so that we realize there was something bigger and better in the world, which is a woman. And we now run from our women to the work. Some of the husbands in the house, today needs to be a new day for you in regards to work and in regards to your woman and your life. 
Because at the end of your life, you're not going to want one more day on the farm. You're not going to want one more day in the bank. You're not going to want one more email to be sent. You're going to want your wife and your kids around you. The Spirit, and only the Spirit, not my words, not a sermon, not anything else that's happening this morning can help you be a better husband. Only the Spirit of God can help you be the husband God's called you to be. Let me be transparent with you for a second. Last night, many of you know my wife is 36 weeks pregnant, and uh, she had a specific request for a meal. And she hasn't had that often, but like many pregnant ladies do, every now and then they have a very specific craving they want, something they want to eat. And so Joy told me, I want blueberry muffins, I want sausage and cream cheese croissants. Every time I say croissant, I have to put a French thing on it, a croissant, you know what I'm saying? And then she said, I want omelets, vegetable omelets. And I was like, okay. And in my head I was thinking, that's going to take some time. So I start, I get all the things together, all the supplies together, and I start dinner about 4 o'clock, a little bit before 4. I don't finish dinner till about 5.20. So for an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes, an, I'm just kidding. For a while, I'm cooking this dinner. Now before you are like, oh, what a great husband, he's so awesome. No, 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 no. Let me tell you my sin, it's coming, Okay. So after that dinner, I'm kind of sitting there. I sit down. Hour and 20 minutes I've been cooking. I have been serving, giving up my life for my wife and my family. Should have been like proud of that, fine with that. But the kids got in and they started eating and Joy started eating. And, you know, they were kind of like, hey, thanks, Dad. For th thanks, Blake, for cooking this. Thanks. And I was like, <laughs> hour and 20 minutes I spent on that. Thanks is not... And it started building in me, that flesh in me, that pride in me started building up. And, and so we got done with dinner, and the kids just took their plates to the sink and ran off. All these pots in the kitchen, all this stuff that I had to clean up. And Joy was like, hey, I've got to make this call, and I've got to do this real quick with the laundry. I've got to do this. You got this, right? And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I got this. Yeah, sure. 45 minutes, 45 minutes of cleaning. So now I've got two hours invested in this meal. And Joy walks by me while I'm washing the dishes. And when I say washing the dishes, I mean taking the metal off the bottom of the pot. Like I'm there. Grr, grr. And she walks by me and she says, hey, uh, are you okay? You all right? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Why, why are you asking that? And she said, well, you just look kind of frustrated. And that's when I lost it. So I lost it. And I said, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a little frustrated. I spent two hours doing all this meal and, and, and doing all this meal for you, that what you wanted, and all these kids, and all y'all said was, like, I'm like, oh, thanks, Dad, I appreciate it. Two hours and ten minutes I've been doing all this. She let me rant and rave. I was so mad. I was, I was letting her have it. I was like, oh, oh, yes. She got done. I, she, I said, all that I did, and here's what she said to me. Hey, what are you preaching on tomorrow? Oh, and then she said, that. I, said, I looked at her and said, don't bring that up. And she said, I'll just let you deal with that. And she walked off. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, that, that was, uh, that's the honest truth. That's exactly how it happened. And the point I wanted to make with that is this. Not just so you could laugh at me because it is funny. But the point is this. I've studied every bit of the Greek of this passage of Scripture. I know it backwards and forwards. This is not the first time I've preached this passage. Matter of fact, I've probably preached, preached it five or six times. I know everything that I was going to say this morning, everything about what Paul is laying out for husbands and wives, as much as I possibly can, at least, understanding this passage of Scripture. I've asked other people. I've looked at commentaries, all this other stuff. And what I realized is, even having all that knowledge, I still can't cook a dinner with, for my family without getting selfish without getting self-centered, without letting, here it is, here's the word, without letting pride creep in. I need the Spirit of God to help me serve my wife. Now here's the last truth, and we're going to bring all this together, and I'm going to invite Caleb back up as we land this plane this morning. Listen, you want a successful marriage? You want a marriage that exalts Jesus and that blesses your children? You've got to have the Spirit of God, ladies. To help you respect your husband. 
And gentlemen, you want a successful marriage, you want to be the husband Christ has called you to be, you cannot do it apart from the Spirit of God helping you. And the last truth that we're going to see this morning is that the Spirit empowers marriages to succeed. I'm going to share with you the last verse there in verse 33. Nevertheless, here's Paul's last encouragement to the marriages, the married people. Each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. New word there. Wasn't the same word that he used for the church and for the wife. It's a new word, respect. Respect. And love. Love and respect. Listen, a successful marriage is not you and your husband building your dream home. A successful marriage is not you having, being the power couple and him being the entrepreneur, you being the entrepreneur and all these things. All those things are awesome. Building homes are great. And entrepreneurs, that's wonderful. A successful marriage is not raising good kids, even though that is wonderful also. A successful marriage in the eyes of God is two words. Love, respect. Love, respect. And you and I can't, we can't even, even though we've boiled it down to those two words, we can't do that without the Spirit of God helping us. We can't love our wives, men, the way God's called us to without His Spirit. And we cannot, ladies, you cannot respect your husbands without the Spirit of God. He doesn't deserve my respect. He, she doesn't deserve my love. Doesn't matter. You know why? Because we didn't deserve His love either. We get so conceited, so self-seeking, so focused on us. They don't deserve it. And we don't realize that the mouth of the person who says they don't deserve it doesn't deserve the grace and love of God. If you were to write a passage that was the complete opposite of this verse, like the complete opposite, if you were writing your own Bible, if that was even a thing you'd want to do, and you wanted to write the complete opposite of what Paul is telling us here, what God is telling married couples, you can boil it down to one word, one word, pride, pride. There's a country music singer named Roger Miller. I don't know if Roger was a Christian or not, but he sure had some good insight into marriage. And here's what Roger Miller's old country song said. The opposite of these words here. Two broken hearts, lonely, looking like houses where nobody lives. Two people, each having so much pride inside. Neither side forgives the angry words spoken in haste. Such a waste of two lives. And here's the chorus. Here's what he says. It is my belief that pride is the chief cause and the decline in the number of husbands and wives. Pride is the opposite of love and respect. And so this morning, some of you are here you are saved, you know Jesus, you're married, or you're not married, whatever it is. The invitation for you this morning is not to memorize this passage, is not to be able to boil it down. The application for you this morning is for you or your, your wife or husband or just you yourself to simply ask God here in this next moment and in every moment, the first thing that you ask Him when you wake up is simply this, Father, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. And then help me to be the husband or the dad or the whatever it is. Fill me with your spirit. I can't do this on my own. Matter of fact, Jesus tells us in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Fill me with your spirit and help me today. That is your application this morning for the believers in the house for people who know Christ. But I also am am very aware that there may be some people here that know about Jesus but don't know Him. You're sitting here this morning and you're not married 
and, and you showed up to a church service, you don't know this guy, you don't, you've never been here before, and you're like, what is this all about? What is, the, what, what is this? Well, listen, I want to share something with you. You may not be married. That's totally fine. But I'm going to share something with you. Jesus loves you. And he loves you so much that he talks about here in this passage that he died for you. He cherished you so much that he took the punishment of your sin on the cross and he died for you. And he was buried and he rose again. And now Christ, he wants to save you. He wants to make you a part of his family. If you're here this morning, you're like, I want that. Then you can come forward and talk to me, talk to Pastor Breck or Caleb anybody in the house, but you all you need to know to say is, I want to be saved. I want to know Christ. Some of the husbands in the room, that's what needs to happen. Some of the wives in the room, that's what needs to happen. Be filled with the Spirit. Or be filled with pride. I'm going to pray for us this morning, and then you respond to Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you've given us your word and you've given us your spirit. And I pray this morning for the couples in the room that are, that are struggling, that are hurting, that are at war with each other right now. Father, I pray that you would, by your spirit's help, bring love and respect to their home, to their family. And God, I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know Jesus, that today would be the day, the most wonderful day of their salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You stand.